Hey everyone, I'm Katie. I'm an assistant naturalist here at the Latotomy Nature Center at North Park. And today we're gonna learn all about owls. So when I talk about owls, I love to say that they're really stealthy creatures because there's some really cool adaptations that make them excellent top predators. So let's get into this presentation and learn a little bit more about them. So the first thing that's really cool about owls is that they are nocturnal, which we know means that they come out at night. So this is true for most owl species with some exceptions. So because they're nocturnal, they need to have some adaptations in terms of their eyesight that allows them to fly through the forest without smacking into a tree or something like that. So one of the first things that's really cool about owls is that they have what is called binocular vision. So here I have a bone clone of our barred owl, and you can see that the eyes are situated on the front of the head. That is called binocular vision, and humans have this too. This is true for most large predator species, and it allows for excellent depth perception as well as like being able to tell the speed and the size of an approaching object. So the opposite of binocular vision is something called monocular vision. And you often see this on prey species. So you can see here on my friendly little Canada goose that his eyes are on the sides of his head. He has monocular vision, meaning that he actually has a wider field of view, but the eyes almost operate separately, meaning that depth perception is really lacking. So the next thing that's really cool about owls' eyes is that they do their eyeballs are more like eye tubes. So their eyes are shaped more like an elongated tube that's actually held in place by something called a sclerotic ring. So because of that, eyes cannot actually move their, or owls cannot move their eyes in their sockets. So they cannot look like up, down, side to side, or roll their eyes like humans can. So they overcome the fact that they cannot roll their eyeballs by instead rotating their heads. So an owl can rotate its head an impressive 270 degrees, which in this video almost looks like an entirely full circle. Kind of creepy, but super awesome. And this helps them overcome the fact that they cannot roll their eyeballs. So that binocular vision with that excellent depth perception paired with the fact that they can look almost entirely around them helps them have a really great field of view. And they can do this because they actually have 14 neck vertebrae, which is about seven more than your average bird. So if we were to try this, we'd probably just pass out, but an owl can do it because they have those extra bones. So now I want to talk a little bit about rod cells and cone cells, which I'm sure sounds very complicated, but these are what are known as photoreceptors. So they help you detect light and color. So owls have this and so do humans. We have rod cells, which help us see light and detail, and we have cone cells, which really help us see color. But the interesting thing about those cone cells is that they actually cease to function below the light of a full moon, meaning that in darkness, we are colorblind. So I'm sure that you've noticed this if you've ever been out hiking at nighttime or just in a room in the darkness, it's kind of hard to distinguish between colors. Everything just looks like different shades of black and white. And you could demonstrate this if you wanted to, maybe take some like different color pipe cleaners or post-it notes and go out for a hike at nighttime, let your night vision adjust, and then try to tell the difference between those colors. You probably won't be able to because those cone cells are no longer working. So because owls are primarily out at nighttime, these cone cells aren't as useful to them. So they actually have less cone cells than a human does, meaning that they see in black and white. But because they have less cone cells, they have more of those rod cells, those cells that register light and detail, meaning that the image that they see is about two and a half times brighter than what a human would see. So they are totally fine flying through the forest at nighttime. But one of the things that I want to point out about the human eye is the way that our photoreceptors are aligned. So our cone cells are actually right in the center and they're surrounded by rod cells, meaning that in darkness, those cone cells, the ones that see color, cause us to have a blind spot in our eyes. So the center of our eye is actually pretty much blind when it's dark. And you may have noticed this if you've ever been on a hike or in a dark room and you look directly at an object, that object actually disappears. But if you shift your vision from right or to left, all of a sudden it comes back into focus. And that's because those cone cells, which are in the center, are no longer working in the darkness. 
So you can also demonstrate this by doing something called the disappearing head game. So you take a partner, you go outside, let your night vision adjust, and then stare directly at each other's heads. You will notice that the person's head starts to disappear. But if you look to the right or to the left and you engage those rod cells, all of a sudden they come back into focus. So that's something really cool to keep in mind when you're out at nighttime. And one other thing about owl's eyes is that they have something called eye shine. So I'm sure that you've noticed this before if you've ever tried to take a picture of like your cat or your dog at nighttime and you see those crazy reflecting eyes coming back at you. Or even if you've shined your light in the forest at nighttime and saw some spooky glowing eyes, that is referred to as eye shine. And what it is is it's basically an extra thin membrane on the eye that's super reflective. So as light comes in, it reflects off of that and funnels back into the retina, causing that image to be even brighter than we would perceive it. So you'll see this eye shine in most nocturnal species because they really need that to help amplify the very little light that's out there at nighttime. Humans do not have eye shine. We instead have what is called red eye. So if you've ever been trying to take a picture at nighttime with the flash and you get these creepy glowing red eyes, what you're seeing is actually the blood flowing through your retinas. It's like an instant snapshot of the blood in your eyes, which is really cool. And the reason that you see that is because we don't have that eye shine to keep that reflection and distract from that blood running through your retinas, which is so crazy and cool to me. So the last thing about owl eyes is that they actually have a whole extra eyelid called a nictating membrane, and that goes diagonally across the owl's eye, and this really shows how important the, owl eye, or the owl's eyes are to them, as they have that whole extra eyelid to help clean and protect their eyes. So now that you know that owls have really great vision, I'm sure that it won't surprise you to know that they have excellent hearing as well. So if I were to point to this great horned owl right here and ask you where the ears were, most people would say, oh, right here, these little tufts right up at the top. Well, those are just called ear tufts, and those are literally just feathers. So scientists theorize that those are to help break up their silhouette and camouflage them a little bit when they're up in a tree. But an owl's real ears are on the sides of its head, hidden by feathers. And they're also crooked. So one ear is a little bit higher, one ear is a little bit lower. Meaning that this ear can hear sound from above, this ear can hear sound from below, allowing them to pinpoint exactly where that sound is coming from. That coupled with the fact that their face is kind of shaped like a, and works like a satellite dish. So you can see in this image right here, and also even if you look at our barred owl here, or even our barn owl right here, their faces are really flat, and they're surrounded by fringed feathers. So that acts like a satellite dish, because sound will come in and bounce off and funnel towards their ears, amplifying that sound even more. So because of this, an owl can actually hear a beetle running through the grass about 100 feet away, and the squeak of a mouse over half a mile away. So clearly they can hear really well. Alrighty, now let's talk about owls and flight. So owl wings are very large for their size. So here is the wing of a great horned owl, which is our largest owl in Pennsylvania. And here is the owl of a turkey. So turkeys are much larger than your great horned owl, yet their wings are almost the same size. So owl wings are so large because it allows them to fly quietly and also carry away prey that may be many times their body weight. So because these wings are large, they're, and they're also very soft with little tiny hooks on the edges, that allows sound to flow right, or air to flow right over top and break up that sound, allowing for completely silent flight. Meaning that by the time that that owl approaches its prey, they didn't even know what hit them. So if you were here, you would feel how truly soft this wing is in comparison to something like the turkey. So I have a really cool video to show you guys. It's going to demonstrate the difference between owl flight and other birds when it comes to how loud they are. So first you're gonna hear a pigeon fly over some microphones, then a falcon fly over some microphones, and lastly, a barn owl. Now, it's Kim's turn. 
So you can see that owls are totally quiet when they fly, which is very fascinating. So now that you know all the cool adaptations that make them so stealthy, let's talk about what exactly they're eating and how they are catching that prey. So owls will pretty much eat anything that is live caught. They'll eat anything from insects to amphibians up to large, or large and small rodents, even skunks. Um, and it depends on the species. So if you're talking about something small like our screech owl, he's going to really love to eat insects and mice. But if you're talking about something larger like our great horned owl here, he really likes to eat skunks. So the owl, once they find their prey, they will approach it and they will hit it with a force many times their body weight. And they will use these insanely strong claws to grip that prey and also sever its spine. So by the time that an owl approaches and hits that prey, it's pretty much dead on impact. So they have these really long hooked claws as well as these textured pads, which help them grip and carry away that prey if need be. So I said that they can carry prey many times their body weight. Well, a great horned owl is about three pounds, but one of their favorite snacks is a striped skunk, which is about five. So it's pretty fascinating that they can actually carry them away. So once they do get that prey, they will either carry it somewhere where they can eat it or they'll eat it right there, but they eat their prey whole. So they'll just gobble that entire thing down without stripping the fur or the feathers, and they'll actually eat the bones too, yet they cannot digest these things. So they have to produce what is called an owl pellet which is basically just a ball of owl puke. It's literally just bones and fur and feathers that they cock back up before they go hunting. So I actually have a dissected owl pellet here that I'd love to show you. So because of the size of this pellet when it was originally intact, this was probably from like a great horned owl. And you could see what that owl has been eating by pulling this apart. I'm sure that many of you have done this in your science class. It is so much fun. But you can see that there is, here's a little skull of a mouse. And we also have his two lower jaw bones. So we know there's at least one mouse skeleton in here. And if you wanted to, and you had a lot of time on your hands, you could clean off all these bones and reconstruct them into a tiny little skeleton, which would be lots of fun. So now that you know how cool owls are, I want to encourage you to invite them to your home. So owls are really important for our ecosystem and for our environment because they are known as, what, as a, a keystone species. So a keystone species is a species on which an ecosystem largely depends, such that if it were to be removed, the functioning of the ecosystem would change drastically. So because owls are large predators, they, they tend to be the top of the food chain, and they help keep and check all of the things below them on the food chain. So they love to eat things that we usually consider pests, so insects and rodents. So if you start to see a collapse of owl populations, you'll start to see a, an abundance of uh, pest species. So that's why we really want to help keep our owl populations healthy. And it's unfortunate that we are seeing declines in those populations due to things like mass deforestation and the invalue of dead trees. So owls actually cannot build their own nests. They rely on abandoned nests of things like crows or hawks, or they really prefer to use cavities in trees, which often occur in dead trees. But humans don't see value in dead trees. We tend to cut them down. But I would argue that dead trees are just as valuable as live ones because they create tons of safe spaces for owls and other creatures. So those large cavities are really important for them to raise their babies in and to shield from severe weather. So that's why if you have a dead tree on your property that you're able to keep up, I highly encourage you to do so. Or I highly encourage you to build an owl box. So this is actually pretty easy to do. You can do it in a day. And if you just look up on the PA Game Commission, they have tons of wildlife plans for all kinds of wildlife boxes. And you could choose a box that fits the species that you want to attract. So if you do go ahead and build that box, you could put it about 15 to 20 feet up on a tree. Um, you want to scatter about two to three inches of leaf litter or maybe wood chipping, some soft organic material that's a safe space for them to lay their eggs on. And you also want to make sure the opening of the owl box is not facing west, as that is the direction that our weather comes in. So you don't want them to get, be like pelted by rain or snow or anything like that. So let's talk about a bit about our Pennsylvania owls. We are lucky to have eight species here in Pennsylvania. 
So we have our great horn owl, our barred owl, our eastern screech owl, the northern sawwet, which I'm sure that you heard about in the Rockefeller tree this year, the long-eared owl and the short-eared owl, the barn owl and the snowy owl, which is the Harry Potter owl, and it's also a migrant from uh, the Arctic in the winter time. So around this time of year and around North Park, these three owls are the ones that you're most likely to see. So our great horned owl, which is this guy right here, our screech owl, which is this little guy over here, and then your barred owl, which is this big guy in this case. So let's start with our great horned owl. These are our largest owls in Pennsylvania, and they are also our most abundant owls in Pennsylvania. And they're known as the most powerful bird in North America, which is pretty cool. And they are known as that because they have been known to displace and even kill bald eagles. Um, and their talons, when clenched, require the force of 28 times their body weight to open up. So that's why people call them the most powerful bird. But for as large as they are, they're actually quite adaptable. You can find them in pretty much every environment. They love forests with large trees or any area with a lot of old trees because those have tons of cavities. And this time of year is when they're doing their courtship rituals and come about like January to mid-March is when they're gonna start laying their eggs. So I'm gonna go ahead and play the call of the great horned owl for you. And this is probably the owl call that you're most used to hearing. This is the one that they'll add into the background of movies when there's like a night scene. So this is going to be your great horned owl. So that classic hoo 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 call. So next we have our eastern screech owl, which is our second most abundant in Pennsylvania and is also our second smallest in Pennsylvania, the smallest being your northern sawwet. So here is our screech owl and he comes in a variety of colors. You can see he's in his more gray version, but they also can be seen in more of like a reddish brown version. But because these guys are so small, they're the ones that are primarily eating insects and small rodents like mice. And also because they're eating insects, they are the ones that are most affected by pesticide use. So if you're someone that is constantly using pesticides or having to trap and remove things like mice or um, other small rodents, I would highly discourage you from doing that and instead tell you to invite these guys to your home. They're going to be a little bit prettier than a pesticide and they're just really fun to watch. So their courtship is this time of year in February and they'll have eggs on the nest between April and May. So I like to say that their call kind of sounds like a winning horse. So let me go ahead and play that Eastern Screech Owl call for you guys. Alrighty, and our last owl happens to be my favorite. That is the barred owl. And I love him so much because they're very curious owls and they also have a really cool call. So unlike your great horn and your screech, which are pretty general when it comes to diet and habitat, these guys are pretty specific. They like woodlands with swamps or wetland areas, and they like to eat things that would be found in swamps and wetlands. So they love crayfish, amphibians like frogs and toads, and they'll even eat uh, snakes sometimes. So that's your barred owl. I like to remember that they're called the barred owl because it kind of looks like they have bars going down their chest. So you can see that on our friendly little guy over here. And they're pretty interesting because they are regarded as nocturnal. I mean, you can pretty much see them at any point of the day. I've actually seen one in West Virginia just sitting on a power line in the middle of the day during the summer. So you never really know when these guys are gonna pop up. But these guys are very playful. They're often to fly in and call back when you are out owling. So let me go ahead and play their call. And their call is the reason that they are my favorite because they kind of sound like they're saying, who cooks for you, who cooks for y'all? So I'll go ahead and play that for you. This is your barred owl. All right, you guys. So now that we know all about owls, the really cool adaptations that make them so stealthy, as well as why you should encourage them to visit your home, I want to talk to you guys a bit about owling. So owling is the process of going out for a hike at nighttime and calling for owls. And this works for a couple different reasons, which are very important to understand. So owls are territorial and they're trying to find mates this time of year. 
So if you call an owl, it may either fly in to see who's invading its territory or call back because it thinks you're a potential mate. So this is why it's important to understand that you should not go out there and call nonstop for hours straight because you're gonna stress the owls and distract them from doing things that they should be doing, like finding mates, setting up territory, sitting on eggs, all kinds of things like that. But also when you're out there, I want you to keep in mind to stick to one species when you're calling because some owls like to eat some other owls. So there's an unfortunate story of a naturalist that called in a little screech owl, that's this guy over here. He flew in and was talking back to them and they were having a great time. Then all of a sudden he switched to calling the great horned owl. Well, the great horned owl likes to eat the screech owl. So that great horn flew in and gobbled up that screech owl right away. So that's why it's important to research maybe what owls are most common in your area and then go ahead and stick to one call when you're out there. But since we did talk about how excellent their eyesight and their hearing is, I also want to tell you guys that you want to be as quiet and as dark as possible when you're out there. So as far as darkness, you could totally just go for a hike using just your night vision. After about 30 to 45 minutes, the human eye adjusts and you can see much better than you think. But if you feel that you need light, just use light that has a red light setting. So maybe a flashlight or a headlamp that has a red light setting, or you can even put like red cellophane over top of your flashlight and be as quiet as possible. So minimize your cell phones or, and turn off that volume and don't even talk when you're out there. Just use it as a really nice quiet time to be out there with the owls and that's how you'll be most likely to call them in. So guys, I hope you had a great time. I hope you learned a little bit of something today. If you do build an owl box or have a really cool experience when owling, I'd love for you to share it in the comments below. Or if you have any questions, feel free to just comment them down there and I can respond to you through Facebook. But other than that, thank you so much for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Thanks guys, bye.